Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Pritchard, and my role is Chief Brand Officer at Procter & Gamble. There's no question in my mind that P&G and our brands can make a powerful difference in the world through innovation on sustainability. And it is a great honor for me to be hosting this session of the P&G Sustainability Summit with our keynote guest, a true beacon of hope for our planet. Let me introduce our guest. In 1960, at the age of 26, she traveled from England to what is now Tanzania and ventured into the little known world of wild chimpanzees. Equipped with little more than a notebook, binoculars, and her fascination with wildlife, she braved a realm of unknowns to give the world a remarkable window into humankind's closest living relatives. Through nearly 60 years of groundbreaking work, initially alone, and then through the decades by a dedicated team at Gombe, she has not only shown us the urgent need to protect chimpanzees from extinction, she has also redefined species conservation to include the needs of local people and the environment. Before the pandemic, she traveled the world, speaking about the threats facing chimpanzees and environmental crises, urging each of us to take action on behalf of living things and the planet we share. Over the last nearly two years, she's adopted and leveraged technology to deliver her message of hope and activism to even larger audiences around the world. It is a true honor to welcome her for the first time to our P&G Sustainability Summit. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Goodall, primatologist, anthropologist, and environmental activist. Hello, Dr. Goodall. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. We are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And uh, you have, you know, you're, you're uh, legendary in terms of the, the, the number of things that you've done. It's just so, so much of an honor to hear from you today. And, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, we've always thrived to take action as a company um, to do good. And, but as we begin 2022, we find ourselves at a time where we really need to think differently about the problems of the earth that are facing us across so many different areas, climate, water, waste, and of course, nature. And this summit is called Hope for Our Home and is inspired by your book and really your life, Book of Hope. And we wanna learn more about what's needed to drive the change we need. So we, we look forward to hearing about your journey, your approach, and to help us reflect, but more important for us to take action to accelerate our progress. We wanna raise the bar to make a difference. So let's start with your journey. And it's an inspiration for all of us. Then there's obviously many turning points that change the way you look at the future. Uh, we'd love to hear you tell us a little bit about your journey so far and how it's defined who you are today. Okay, well, thank you. My, um, I'm speaking to you from the house where I grew up in Bournemouth in the south of England, where I've been since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as you say, making use of technology to carry on doing what I feel I need to do. So it all began here, tiny little girl, born loving animals. People say, where did your love come from? I was born with it. And a very supportive mother, she's up here behind me, uh, who, who nurtured this love of animals and didn't get mad when she found I'd taken earthworms to bed with me and filmed the, fill, um, filled the bed with, with wriggling worms and, and of course the earth as well, just said, I think that they better go back in the garden. They might die here. So that's how she supported me. And she found books for me to read about animals, thinking I'd learn to read more quickly. I was eight years old when I met Dr. Doolittle, oh, speaking to animals how I wanted to do that. <laughs> and the first book I ever saved up enough money to buy secondhand, we had very little money, was Tarzan of the Apes fell in love with this glorious lord of the jungle, determined I'm going to grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. I always loved writing. No thought of being a scientist. Girls weren't scientists in those days. Everybody laughed at my dream. How will you do that? Africa's far away. Um, you don't have money and you're just a girl, but not my mother. She said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, you may find a way. So that I, I stress that because it's something that's so important for parents today to support the, the goals and dreams of their children, even 
first they seem inappropriate, support them. And if it's inappropriate, the child will find out soon enough. So anyway, um, I amazingly got invited by a school friend to Kenya when I was 23. And there I became a paleontologist, Lou B. Leakey. Mm. And he just saw something in me that caused him to ask if I'd like to go and study our closest relatives. Nobody had studied them. And I hadn't even been to college, couldn't afford it. But off I went and it took him a year to get the money. I mean, what a ridiculous idea, a young girl going into the forest. The British authorities, because Tan Tanzania was Tanganyika back then, that's how long ago it was. And um, part of the crumbling British empire the authority said, a young girl on her own in the forest, we will not take responsibility. In the end, they said, all right, but she's got to have somebody. That same amazing mother came. And her story is for another time, but she was a great support for four months, money for six months. Chimps running away every time they saw me. Patience, patience, patience. I'd learned that as a child. And eventually, after four months, one See, David Greybeard, here he is behind me, began to lose his fear. And that never to be forgotten, that first real, you know, moment that changed everything. I saw him using grass stems as tools to fish nights from their nest, stripping leaves from twigs, make tools. At that time, man was defined as man the tool maker. Mm. And so when I told Lewis Leakey, he said, ah, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimps as humans. <laughs> but the great thing was that meant the National Geographic came in, money to support me after the six months ran out, and they sent a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Loeck. Leakey also insisted after a year and a half that I go to university. It was no time for a bachelor's, I mean, an undergraduate degree. Uh, so he got me a place uh, to do a PhD in Cambridge University. I was terrified. I mean, I'd never been to college. Uh, imagine what I felt like when the professors, most of them, told me I'd done everything wrong. Chimps should have been given numbers, not names. And I couldn't talk about their personality, their mind or their emotion. Those were unique to us, I was told. The difference between humans and all the other animals was one of kind. Well, I'd already learned from my dog as a child that that wasn't true. But as I've done throughout my life, I didn't confront the professors or argue with them. I just went on quietly talking about things the way I knew them to be. And then of course I was supported by Hugo's film. People had to believe tool using when they saw the chimps for themselves. And um, so anyway, then I built up a little research station. I got my PhD, best days of my life out in the rainforest. A conference in 1986 changed everything again. It was another pivotal moment because it was a four day conference about chimp behavior, but we had a session on conservation and a session on conditions in some captive situations like medical research. And I, it, it was shocking. And I went to that conference as a scientist. I left as an activist. I knew I had to do something. I didn't know what to do. But I started actually going into the labs. Our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages, maybe 20, 30 years. And in Africa, forest disappearing, chimpanzee numbers dropping, got together some money to go out to Africa. And there I learned not only about the plight of the chimps, but also the poverty of so many of the people living in and around chimp habitat. And it came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, which had been part of the great equatorial forest belt when I began. By the late 80s, it was a tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, more people living there than the land could support. And that's when I realized if we can't 
help these people find ways of living without destroying the environment. We can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. So that's my story in a nutshell. And it's brought me to where I am today. And, you know, the last big challenge was how to carry on sharing my message with the world when I was grounded here in this tiny little attic room, which is <laughs> also my bedroom and it's my office and it's my studio. So <laughs> there we are. That's, that's my story for you. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Goodall. What a remarkable story. And as you were speaking, it was bringing back my own personal memories because uh, I remember I grew up in the 60s. So I remember uh, your, your, uh, the films, seeing you in, in National Geographic, uh, seeing the, and just being amazed at, at what you were finding and then becoming so fascinated with, with, with animals and with, uh, with the environment. And, and, uh, and I see that you've just continued that uh, over time. And um, we were very, very inspired by what you're doing, particularly Roots and Shoots. So you'll, you'll be happy to know we'll be contributing to that as well. So we think that's a great program. Um, so thank you, because we, we do believe that, uh, that we have to uh, all do our part and help the next generation do so. And that leads me to a question, which is, you know, one of the things that we've observed is that protecting the planet, protecting wildlife, you know, protecting um, our, 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 our environment, that, that may not generally be hardwired into the behavior and habits of human beings, or at least that's not what you know, we've observed. And some, some people think that doing so is at a cost for them. Some people are completely indifferent. You know, given this situation, you know, what, why do you believe there is, there is hope that we can, that we can change this? And, uh, and what is your observation of, of, of human beings who have been able to make this, these changes happen? Well, I think for one thing, if we go back further in our evolution, I think we were as hardwired as any other species to live in harmony with the natural world because we are part of it and we depend upon it. And we find with the indigenous people around the world, they still have this, this worldview that they are part of nature and the animals are, are their brothers and sisters. So it's, it's in more recent times that we've got caught up in this materialistic society where money and power are valued over and above protecting the environment for the future. And a crazy idea that there can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources, that in the annual growth of GDP is more important than your great grandchild's future. And, you know, finally people are beginning to understand. And as you said in your introduction, the time is now, we really have to, get a new mindset, we have to think differently, and we have to think in terms of is, how does this harm future generations? How does this harm the health of the planet? You know, it, you're, you're right, and as you say that, we, 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 uh, it must be in our, in our nature in some, in some way, but, uh, deep, deep down, so we just need to unlock that. One of the things that that our company is doing is really focusing on how our brands can, can make a difference and how we can not only provide people with the best performing products, you know, cleaning, health, hygiene, but do it in a way that's sustainable. So for example, we're, 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 we figured out a way to make um, laundry detergent that cleans in cold water. So when it cleans in cold water, it reduces energy that is used to heat your, your washing machine. And it actually turns out it's better for your clothes at the same time. <laughs> We're finding ways that if you can, where we can wash dishes, where you don't have to run the faucet, where you can just spray and it wipes off. So there's, there's all these things. And what has been fascinating for us is to start to look at innovation as the way to unlock these opportunities and make make products that not only meet people's needs, but also make them sustainable. So, so I'd, I'd love to hear some stories of success that you're seeing and some stories of hope that you're seeing on where either, you know, wherever it may be, whether it be companies or brands or 
or NGOs or wherever that give us some inspiration as to how we can we can keep pushing forward on this front. Well, I think you know one of the one of the reasons for hope is that more and more of the big corporations like PNG are beginning to see the light and beginning to see that change is important. And I was talking to the CEO of a big corporation about a month ago. And he said, Jane, I've been working really to change the way we operate along the supply line in the country where our products are sourced uh, to make everything ethical, the wages of the people working with the community like you do. Um, and he said, for three reasons. One, I saw the writing on the wall that these resources we're using are not infinite, they're finite. And we're using them up in some cases faster than nature can repair them. And so we're doomed if we carry on with business as usual. And secondly, consumer pressure. More and more people are becoming educated and they're making, they're wanting the goods that they buy to have been produced in an ethical way, which as a sideline there, this can never really change the world until we alleviate poverty. Because if you're really poor, you just have to buy the cheapest. You can't afford to ask questions that we can. Is it, was it, was it harmful to the environment, cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages? You just have to buy the cheapest. But then he said that the final, the final incident that really got to me and, you know, tipped the balance was my little girl, eight years old coming home from school one day about 10 years ago and saying, Daddy, they tell me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. Mm -hmm. And he said, that, that just got there. And he'd already been thinking they had to change and this did it. So that's, that's one reason that I see a lot of hope in this change. And as we've now got hundreds and thousands of young people around the world, all, I mean, once they know the problems and they're empowered to take action, they're so energetic and passionate and determined, and they're not going to give up. And they fail with one project, well, then they start another one. And some of them who, who were high school in 1991 when we began, they're out in decision-making positions, and they seem to take their values with them that they mm -hmm. learned in Roots and Shoots, and if I'm asked to pick one word, one value that is most significant, it would be respect. Respect for each other, respect for the environment, respect for animals. They take that with them. And when you do that, then you, then you really focus on respecting the environment, creating a sustainable, even a regenerative uh, approach to, to business. Uh, and, um, t uh, you know, I want to hear a little more about Roots and Shoots. Give us a little more on that, because that, that's actually sounds like there's a there's a lot of opportunity in that in that uh, that area. So could you just give us a little bit of a of an insight into what Roots and Shoots does and, and how other people can get involved? OK, well, it began in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam with 12 high school students coming to ask me, what could be done about things like poaching in the national parks? The government wasn't doing anything. Illegal dynamite fitting, uh, fishing. Um, children on the streets with no homes. Cruel treatment of stray dogs, that sort of thing. And I told them to gather their friends together who were also concerned. And that's where Roots and Shoots was born. And the reason for the three projects, animals, people, environment, was because in the rainforest, I'd learned that everything is interconnected. This mm -hmm. amazing tapestry of life that we call biodiversity that we're now in danger of losing. And so for the young people to understand from an early age, you know, it's no good just thinking about one project. You can't tackle them all. But if you know that groups like you, the people who do care passionately about this, passionately about that. so. For example, in, in little Burundi and in Uganda and in larger countries like Austria, they're planting thousands, and I mean thousands, of trees and looking after them. Um, they're doing huge beach campaigns, clean, cleaning up the beaches and the rivers. They're removing 
exotic uh, plants that are clogging up waterways. Uh, they are volunteering in shelters for homeless people, but also for animals. Uh, they're launching campaigns. There's one about the use of unsustainable palm oil. There's another one about ocean pollution. There's another one about trafficking wildlife. And of course, it was trafficking wildlife that led to this pandemic that has so disrupted countries all around the world. Mm. So these are the kind of things. And our university students, you know, they really, they're, they're, they're making change every day. We are seeing that. And, and that, that really gives us great inspiration uh, moving forward and, and looking at the opportunities because we are a company that just loves to innovate. We love to innovate to solve problems. And what you're describing are some of the things that, that we're doing, we're working on ways that we can eliminate plastic waste. We're looking at how to reduce water. We're looking at ways to reduce energy. We, we plant for every tree we use, we plant two. We actually grow two to ensure that uh, forests regenerate. It, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating what's available to us when we open our eyes and then combine our, um, our, our know-how to be able to create something that can actually be, be good for the planet as well as good for all the people around it. So tell me a little bit about, as you think about a company like P&G, what do you think that our brands and our company can do to accelerate uh, change so we can achieve the better future for our planet? Well, I think um, having relationships with NGO who can share a message about the things you're doing that are good, and obviously meeting with people who might give you ideas as to how you can do better or how you can change for the better in a certain area. And as I said to you before we began, uh, before I was going to talk to you, I looked up Procter & Gamble's uh, record when it came to animal testing and was delighted to find out that from way back when uh, your people have been working to reduce the use of animals and treat them better. Indeed. And, you know, I, as, I, as I mentioned to you, uh, before I, I, I took one of my roles, I had a special assignment where I led the company's task force on eliminating animal testing. That was in, in 1995. And it was because our leaders saw that this is something that we should do. It's the right thing to do. And so we looked at finding every possible alternative we can. So I'm glad you looked that up. I'm glad you saw that. That's the kind of thing that a company can do. And we were more than willing and still are more than willing to work with other companies to be able to, uh, to, to advance um, things like elimination of animal testing. So uh, thank you for, for recognizing that. You see, um, things are moving in the right direction and more people care and more people understand that animals are sentient beings, they're individuals. And that's why I think the movement towards vegetarianism and veganism is growing, partly from the, the destruction of the natural world to grow the grain to feed these billions of animals in factory farms, and that they're all producing methane gas, one of those you know, really bad greenhouse gases, wasting water, changing vegetable to animal protein. And it's just, you know, when you think that every one of these animals crammed into these terrible places, mm. is an individual feeling fear and pain. It mm. just gets to you. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And then, and as you described that, you know, the, the technology is starting to become available to be able to replace things. So that's, that's, that's the mindset. I think if we can shift to, we can make a difference. Um, you mentioned something too, which is working together in partnerships with NGOs or with governments or with media. So, you know, tell us about that. There's a misconception in some cases that companies and NGOs can't work together, but you know, what, what do you think that we should be doing and how could we make sure that we can work together with different NGOs, governments to drive action for the planet or animals? Um, what, why is that so important too? Well, it began way back when I was fighting the way chimpanzees were treated in medical research. And when I first 
got permission to go into a lab. I don't know why they let me in, but anyway, they did. <laughs> and it was a, a funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US. And when I came out from that visit, I was shattered. I mean, it's one thing to see a video. It's another thing to actually be there and see it with your own eyes. And I came out and I was shattered. And I saw this table of men, all the top weeks of NIH in the animal testing area. And I realized they were waiting for me to speak. And I, you know, I was very young back then. And I didn't know what to say. I was more or less in tears. And so I said, I'm sure all of you are caring and compassionate people. And any caring and compassionate person must feel as I do about what's going on in there. So instead of attacking them, telling them how bad they were, you know, I showed them pictures of how the chimps live. And I could see their eyes turning in. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of them just weren't educated. They didn't understand. I was attacked by animal rights organizations. How could you sit down with those people? Um, How could you have a cup of tea with them? Because if you don't talk to people, can you ever expect them to change? And then it was the same when we took money from Conoco, the oil and gas company, way back before it amalgamated as it has since, but when it was just Conoco. And you can't take money from them because they're harming the environment. Well, actually, they were then the most environmentally sensitive oil and gas company I've ever heard of. Uh, but it cost, and so, you know, it sort of failed in a way. But then I started thinking about it. Okay, I flew out here to Congo. I flew in an airplane that was using their product. I drove in a car that was using their product. I turn on my electric light. And how hypocritical. If there's a company that's really trying to do better and you refuse to take their money because it might make them look good. Mm. On the other hand, if it's a company that's doing a lot of greenwashing and they're really not caring, then you have to be very careful not to get your name associated with them. Well, that is a, a wonderful view because companies like P&G are so focused on doing the right thing. Um, and, and, and I think encouraging companies and working with companies, even though they may be creating waste and water, uh, using water and energy, you know, when, when you get your mindset shifted around on uh, creating a, uh, a doing business, but doing it in such a way that is environmentally sustainable, then we can make remarkable progress so quickly. You know, we've, we've made the commitment to net zero emissions by 2040. We're already halfway there in terms of greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, so far, and we hope, hope to get a lot further by 2030 in our operations and supply chain. But now we're going to the next level, which is our products, the use of our products. You said it when you do your laundry, wash your hair, throw away um, you know, your products, th those all create water, waste, and energy. But when we identify alternatives and ways to to, to do so in such a way that either reduces water or reduces energy or reduces waste, then we do the best we could possibly do. Great products that people like and they're environmentally sustainable. Um, and that's gonna help the whole planet, help animals, and Ed, to your point, help the people people in there. So let's, this has been amazing, but in closing, I'd, I'd love to hear you share your vision for the next decade. Um, what What, what are your key focus areas? What are the challenges that you're looking to overcome and, and where do you want help from companies like P&G? Well, the challenges are huge, which is why some people have given up. And we have this silly expression, think globally, act locally. But honestly, today, if you think globally, really, it is depressing. I mean, we are in a very dark place. But I say to people who've lost hope, don't, don't think about that. You can't do everything. You're just one person. But where you live, is there something you care about? Is there a street that's horribly littered? Are people, you know, wasting food? Is there something you care about that you could do? And then they find that, okay, so they, they do something. They get some people to help. And they see it's made a difference. That makes you feel good. And luckily, 
And so you want to do more to feel better. And as you do that, you inspire more people to join in. And when you then think about Roots and Shoots, for example, and you, you're a Roots and Shoots group and you realize that all around the world in 65 countries, there are young people like you doing their bit, then you dare think globally, then you dare believe there's hope. But you know, um, it depends how we define hope. And I see it, and this came to me after writing this book, that we, the human race, are in the mouth of a very long, dark tunnel with a little star shining at the end, and that's hope. But there's no point in sitting where we are and hoping that star will come to us, no. We have to, as the Bible says, gird our loins and roll up our sleeves, and we have to crawl under, climb over, work our way around all the obstacles, the climate change, the loss of biodiversity, the poverty, the corruption that lie between us and that star. And we have to work our way along and gather in others with us, inspire them to join us until we get to the goal. So my, my goal, my, what I'm focusing on is growing roots and shoots because as I say, they are changing the world. They're changing their parents and their grandparents, some of whom are in very decision-making positions. And some of them, if we get to a critical mass, will be the ones going into politics and law and, and um, they'll be parents and they'll be teachers. They'll be in all walks of life and taking that value of respect with them. And fighting to help alleviate poverty in programs like Tokari in, in Africa, but that now can spread to other countries quite easily, bringing people out of poverty and helping them understand the importance of the environment and continuing to work with, with uh, companies like yours so that we can grow faster and have, you know, share this feeling there is hope if we get together but we can't do it alone. Well, that is a beautiful message of hope that I, I'm certain will inspire everyone uh, in, the, in this session. It's very clear. We'll focus on roots and shoots. We can do our part as a company. We, this organization that we're speaking to now, the um, AMA organization is doing a remarkable job on community impact. Uh, on equality and inclusion, which is a great way to help alleviate poverty because you reduce income and eliminate income inequalities and on environmental sustainability. Um, people like you, Dr. Goodall, just give us great inspiration and great hope. And we thank you for the time that you took with us today. And we promise you that we will do our part to continue to strive toward that light and hope and make the world a better place. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. And just remember that I couldn't have got to where I am alone. We all need help along the, along the road. And my Jane Goodall Institute teams around the world uh, and Roots and Shoots, I owe it all to them. And to my amazing mother and my dog and David Graybeard the Chimp, my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. You are our hero. Thank you. Thank you.